from the bright lights of Hollywood. Supermodel, sex, drugs, 80s. Who should we call? Of course we'll call McInerney. To the big city of New York. Downtown, there was a lot of creative energy. You could still hear the Ramones, see Jim Carroll and Andy Warhol and Lou Reed. If the road to excess leads to the Palace of Wisdom, no, oh! it did work. In I'm, one I'm, shot, Jay. <laughs> I'm glad that I still have my eyesight. Then my guest, is the wisest of them all. I think it was Hemingway who said, the best thing that can happen to a novelist is the worst thing that can happen to you so long as it doesn't kill you. Today, my good friend Jay McInerney puts it all on the table. Hi Jay, you made Eric. it. Good Where to see you. Ah. How's everything? Good, great. Ah, don't tell me what it is, I need Okay, of course. Yes. First of all, some red wine. A of to drink. Shots enough to pop. To I know, drink I know you cook? like Bordeaux, but but real, for cooking, really, I think a cut to run. Well, Jim McInerney, first of all, is a friend. He's a bon vivant, but mostly for the world, he's one of the greatest writers of his generation. Can I guess? Okay, yeah. He's well, the rooster that you have in the, in the house in Bridgento. Ah! You didn't really brought you a rooster, but no. In this no. case, uh, lamb yeah. shanks. Lamb shanks. You gonna put anchovies? With yeah, it? I. I, I think everything is better with anchovies, but honestly, you're not, I have never you're tried not going to taste this. I never knew that lamb would be uh, enhanced in terms of flavors with a couple of anchovies in the sauce. I have something for oh. you here. Gimonet. You, Very nice. You know that champagne, right? Yes. Uh, the champagne was a surprise for him a little bit. Uh, I know he liked th those kind of champagne. So. Oh! It did work. What I was trying to do with the champagne is what we call in French sabré. The military actually used to do that with a real saber. In one I'm, shot, I'm, Jay. <laughs> I'm glad that I still have my eyesight. Look, we have a pot here. We're going to try like that. Ah. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a, it was a, we no, start, it was a noble We're starting a very powerful, uh, Jay, the show. It really is the best way to open a bottle of champagne. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome. <laughs> mm. I, I, I like to start every venture with champagne, if possible. Yeah, I can imagine that. I don't always use a saber to open it, but, but speaking of occasions, that <laughs> certainly makes it more dramatic and yep. festive and sometimes scary. I know you're more of a red wine guy. I want saber the, the red, that for sure. All right, well, speaking of cooking, this, yeah. this, this dish takes a little while. It's not that hard, but it's, um, it's, 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 a couple, it's a couple of hours. Braised lamb shanks is a, is a dish that I've um, been cooking for, for a really long time. It's a great winter dish, and, and it's it's also a great red wine dish. I love having Eric repair as my sous chef. That's, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm your commis. <laughs> commis is not even the sous chef. Yeah, we've, we've done it before, though. Yeah, yeah we have. Except are. usually I'm the sous chef. I'm going right. to take care of the carrots. I'm going to salt and pepper these lamb shanks. So, Jay, where where are you born, and and where did you grow? I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, but I can't tell you anything about it because I moved when I was six months old. We lived in... Europe, uh, we lived in Geneva, London, in Switzerland? Ben Vancouver, Canada, Chappaqua, New York. Well, I, I really didn't stop moving until I went to college. Are you happy to, with that? In Williamstown. That's the right size or? Perfect. It's perfect? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so, was it a problem to make friends in school and then uh, you don't see your friends again? It's not a great way to grow up. You have to sort of prove yourself over and over again each time. And uh, I, I think I sort of did that partly by developing a sort of class clown mentality and trying to entertain people. And I spent about half my school years in detention or expulsion or something like that, you know, and uh, I guess uh, that tendency has followed me later in life. When I was in uh, England, they had a system of red stars for academic achievement and black stars for uh, for disciplinary problems. And, and I, I my, in my year, I had the most red stars and the most black stars. But when I get to college, yeah. I, I settled down a lot. I love college. Uh, it was, I went to Williams College in uh, Massachusetts and uh, I, I suddenly felt... A liberation? I, I felt at home for the first time. I inherited the Radical Student Organization, which was uh, once called SDS, Students for Democratic Society. And I, uh, what was that? And I took it over. The revolutionary spirit of the 60s was gone, but people still sort of felt a little guilty about going back to being Republicans. So they, so so, when so, you, they, so they gave me a very big bu budget to bring uh, radical speakers to campus. And uh, like, that was, that was I kind I of read fun. somewhere that a Angela Davis, Angela Davis yeah, right? Yeah. That was a scandal? It was a scandal. I guess. Yeah. By this time, everybody just wanted to get a job on um, Wall Street or go to law school. And she was an ex Black she, Panther? She was, or yeah, she was like an ex Black Panther and a Marxist. People I've admired have, have always been 
somewhat iconoclastic and rebellious and um, people who have refused to um, read the script as written. When you brought um, Angela to the campus, was it a scandal with the well, teachers it, it and was. the students there were, and the newspapers? There were, yeah. or? The, um, the more conservative students thought that this was a terrible, a terrible and what thing. Did, what did you do uh, that? And, uh, to be a troublemaker or because yeah, I mean, you had, you had I, a, a found strong a new, opinion? I, I, found it, I think I, partly because I found a new way to cause trouble, and, and, but, but also because I, I did have strong opinions. I, the Vietnam War radicalized me to some extent, I think. I was very, so you, very, you were anti-war? I was very, very opposed to the war. After I graduated, I, I actually went to Japan for two years. A friend of mine was living in Japan. He told me that you could teach English and make a lot of money and have a lot of free time. And I thought this would be a good way to so you have time to write. I wrote a novel, a terrible novel. Um, I taught English. I had many adventures. And then I realized it was time to come home. And New York seemed like the logical place to go. I know Jay for many years, and I never knew that he traveled to Japan. Uh, he lived in England. Uh, and then lived in New York in the 80s when New York was um, totally insane, crazy, uh, with many artists, uh, writers. After arriving in New York, I got a job uh, with the New Yorker magazine as a fact checker. Is it true you got fired from that job? Uh, yes. I got, <laughs> How can I was you get fired as a fact checker? I, it's easy, you take the phone, you call, you say, uh, is it right, is it wrong, and, uh, and, and you don't. I'm just not very good with facts, you know. Um, um, I like to quote the talking heads, facts all come with points of view, facts don't do what I want them to. They look pretty good. They look good. Okay. That looks good. I don't think we'll go home hungry. Uh, so you want the vegetables in the pot? Yeah, and then the, uh, good enough, yeah, a little oil. You come back from Japan, you end up in New York, because it's the most exciting city. Um, At first it was a difficult love affair, because after I got fired from the New Yorker, it was very difficult to support myself. I was writing book reviews and, I, I also, I, when I was in Japan, I met a model whom I brought back to New York and married. Uh, and she subsequently uh, went off to the fashion shows in Italy and um, never came back. And so it was, it was bad. And, and right about the same, right about. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh about that, I, but it's, I mean. I, it's, and right about the now. same time, my mother died. Oh, so that's So I was, uh, um, I was at a very low right. ebb. And uh, I think it was Hemingway who said the, the, the best thing that can happen to a novelist is the worst thing that can happen to you so long as it doesn't kill you. At that point, I happened to meet a writer who I admired very much, Raymond Carver, and we sat down and talked for several hours uh, and really got to know each other. And he, in the course of the, um, the day, said, you know, if you really want to be a writer, living here in New York is, the is, not, it, it, is not the way to do it. Oh, it's not the way to do it. No, I was really living very hard at that point, and I was. Uh, so you I was, were I was going out late at night. I was partying. I was doing a lot of drugs. It was a really interesting moment in New York. It was, um, you know, downtown. There was a lot of lot of creative energy. You had, the, you know, the it was the era of the Mud Club and CBGBs, and you could still hear the Ramones play at CBGBs. Okay. You could go down to the Mud Club and <clears throat> see Jim Carroll and Andy Warhol and Lou Reed and. Um, I would sort of press my nose up against the glass at these uh, interesting places. So Carver suggested to me that I come up and study with him at Syracuse, and that was how I. That's uh, how you end up in so Syracuse. So I applied for a scholarship and was accepted into the creative writing program. Because despite your bad behavior at night, you're still a, still brilliant, right? So they give you a scholarship, I guess. Well, I don't think you can be at the level of Jay as a writer of uh, novels if you don't have knowledge. Uh, and if you don't have discipline. So your influence at that time as a writer, I mean, writers were he what, he Hemingway? There were many writers that um, were important. F. Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce. Um, and, and one of the ways that you find your voice as a writer is to imitate all the writers that you like. And so you one day find that you're speaking, perhaps writing in your own voice. One night I went through all my work and I realized that it was all, I was imitating, I was imitating, I was imitating, and there was one piece of paper that came out of the bottom of my desk and I had written it two years before and I had yes. been, I had come home from a nightclub at six in the morning and it was a terrible, I'd had to walk home, I'd, I'd spent all my money at the nightclub, I'd done all my drugs, I got home and I wrote down this line, and the line was, uh, <clears throat> you're not the kind of guy who would be in a place like this at this time of the morning, but here you are. And I wrote this line down and right. I put it away and I forgot about it. And then two years later I found this line and I said, this is the only original thing that I've ever written. So then I kept going. And um, 
I continued that story about a guy who's messed up at a nightclub at six in the morning, and I that became Bright Lights Big City. When I was finished with the novel, I sent it off to uh, a friend who was working yeah. at Random House. He accepted the book. He, he sort of saved Christmas for me uh, back in, in a uh, sense, in, uh, I guess, back in 1983 by by, by, by sending me a, a, a check, you know. That, that what the, just when my they when the my book. car had broken down and I was about to lose my apartment, so it was very it was very my handy. God, you we're having a tough time. My model wife dumps me. The New Yorker fires me. Um, you know, I just I, I left New York with my tail between my legs, but uh, but you came back. After but, I, that, but then I came back as a novelist. Yeah, the because thing, right like Big City always was always the, the book that put you on the map. I mean, you became famous instantly everywhere. It was a pretty big success. Yes, of course. And it, ch it changed my life. All right. It I'm changed your life. I'm going to add this one. Okay. So you're going to put all the Chateau Neuf, by the way, here, right? I, we're going to see or how much. I, I, I just do half and half. Ah, you have the stock. I mean, we have the stock, yeah. So th this is this also is so not you, half and half. And as usual, I've spilled some here. Half and half. Okay, right. that's fine. So we're doing the anchovies. Ah, the anchovies, uh, you put them now. Yeah. So that's the anchovies. trick. Anchovies. Well, they, it starts to dissolve them. The oh, anchovies, it's melt and it's you, you, won't, you won't know in the end that they're even there. And we need these... Uh, oh, yes. We need well, we the, ro the rosemary. I did this one with the thyme and rosemary. Oh, okay. And this one is separated. I didn't know what you want. It's probably enough right there. Okay. Here. So we bring it to boil? Yes. So Bright Light Big City allows you to come back to New York and live in New York? It was published in 84. The strange thing was that when I, certainly when I wrote the book, I had no concept of the book being about something called the 80s. And yet, Bright Lights Big City somehow became iconic of a the book 80s. about New York in the 80s. Okay, so it's, it's simmering. Yep. I think it's uh, I think it's ready. We just have to check for seasoning. Yep. Tell me what you think. Yep. That's really good. The anchovies give a great flavor. So just about right. I cover so it and we cover it. Oven. Put it in the oven for two hours and 20 minutes. Okay, let's go two hours and 20 minutes. And in the meantime, we're gonna do some wine drinking. If we must. We have to. We must. I have a surprise for you. Oh, good. I brought something yeah. um, for us to do. Uh, look at that. It wouldn't be Bordeaux, would it? Oh, it's surprise. <laughs> I discovered wine, got passionate about it, and fortunately I was able to incorporate that into my life by, by writing about wine. What do you think of uh, 89 uh, Angelus? I've only had it once and it was spectacular. So we are going yeah. to uh, switch and to red, a, I that's, think. That's a really good one, yeah. I wanted to have uh, a good wine today. Jay loves Burgundies, Bordeaux, and I thought the 89 Angelus would be very nice. Try I that, Jay. I think you're gonna like it. Color. And I don't think it needs to be decanted. Let's see what you think. Even before we taste it, we know. That's a beautiful wine, huh? Oh. How will you describe That's that wine, by the way? Because you have a way of describing wine, which is very <laughs> different than your normal um, wine connoisseur. Or a car, it might be an Aston Martin, I think, but... Ooh. Aston Martin, I like. An actress? An actress. Let's Let me see. see. This would be... <laughs> what I see in a glass. This could almost be Angelina Jolie. Oh. Who, uh, and you wrote, by the way, Gia. I wrote Angelina Jolie's uh, first part. I believe it was HBO's first feature film. And, of course, they said um, supermodel, sex, drugs, 80s, AIDS, who should we call? Well, of course we'll call McInerney. They approached me about writing a biopic about Gia Karanji, who was also one of the first women to die of AIDS in 1985. Oh, I didn't know that. So Jay is definitely a celebrity writer. He has been, and we were talking about that, always in the press, uh, in the gossip columns, and so on. There was a point when I was being chased by photographers, so that was... Uh, I guess did you that, like that? I guess that counts. Did you, did you like that? It's very disconcerting <laughs> to suddenly be having a, you know, having dinner with Brad Easton Ellis at Allison on Dominic Street, yeah. and discovering the next day that your waiter had been writing down everything you said and, and called page six, and that there, there it was. You know, literature was di dying when I was when I was in college and when I was uh, trying to become a writer. Everybody said literature doesn't matter. F you know, film and television have killed it. Young people don't read. And so the idea that anybody would pay any attention to me at all was kind of hard to imagine. The early attention and success of Bright Lights was, was, was just mind-boggling and exciting to me, and it never occurred to me that you could get too much attention. You know, Norman Mailer, who, who actually was, was another 
a um, very important writer to me. We were once at a movie premiere together. We were walking down the street and the, the photographers were following us. And he said, he said, Jay, be careful, the flash bulbs will bleach your soul. And I, I mean, of course that was metaphorical, but, yes, yes. but I mean, what he meant was it's possible to have too much exposure, too much publicity, it's possible that this can corrupt you. I didn't know that in 1985, you know? I want to uh, check, see where we are. Uh, oh, yeah. So you should test. Okay, let's see. The sauce is good. Getting there. The lamb gives a lot of flavor yeah. to it. It's powerful, it's just, huh? yeah, the, yeah, the, Almost uh, ready. I'm going to cook the pasta now. Okay, yeah. So your life has been pretty dramatic. You got the success after Bright Light Big City. You have been married three times. Uh, well, four, I'm afraid. <laughs> First wife left me. Second wife was a philosophy major. I reacted strongly the other way. At which point I was dating Marla Hansen, who was a model whose face had been slashed and she was sort of yes, by her ex-landlord. You were attracted to those kind of women who will bring some drama in your life? I, I guess, yes. I, I like mean, drama. I, I, I must like drama. It's drama I would a not, source of inspiration. I wouldn't have lived the way that I live if I, if I, what I really wanted was a quiet life in the suburbs. You if know? your heart would have, wouldn't have been broken, you wouldn't have written I certainly couldn't have written Bright Lights Big City. Well, I think you are you are someone who I mean, has a lot of imagination. This this wine is an aesthetic experience, though, so thank you for that. I know, thank you. And while they cook, we are going to yeah. um, take the meat out, maybe. I noticed something also, like, um, you're a perfectionist in many ways in your lifestyle and in your writing as well. I like to think that I have a streak of perfectionism when it comes to the things that are really important and nothing is more important to me than my writing. I'm very seldom satisfied with the first version of a sentence. It's, it's very important it's very important to get a first draft and to not be paralyzed by the process of telling a story. But at the same time, once I get to the end of a story, then the really um, creative part begins. Jay, we go? Let's, uh, okay, so let's unveil. Really good. Now these are cooked very much on the tender side. We've reduced the sauce here. So, so you want the noodles first? Let's, let's do the noodles first and, okay. then and then we'll just put a little bit of sauce. I put them here. We might need a little pepper. Very, very nice. And then uh, string beans. Okay. Yeah, now I think we just uh, bring the sauce over here. So put a little bit on the... Ah, on the pasta, yeah. Okay. okay. And the pepper. And the sauce smells so good, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's a little... It's really it, good looking It's a dish. little different every time, but the, I think this is a pretty intense version I, of this sauce. I, loved, I love it. Okay, well, let's Shall we on. go around? Yes, of course. Okay, it looks fantastic. Mm. And by now I'm starving. I don't think you'll be starving if you, get, <laughs> if you can get through this lampshade. It's yeah. like falling apart. I think it. Oh man! I think it's a success. So, when you have um, an idea for a novel, it's something that matures in your in your head, and you start to take notes. In the case of my last novel, the idea that I had, I was actually working um, at a soup kitchen at Ground Zero after after September 11th, and I thought this this would be really interesting to have two characters who never would meet each other otherwise to fall in love while they're working in the ruins of the World Trade Towers. And when 9/11 happened, you were uh, in your apartment in Chelsea. You saw the planes going. I had a, a blackout shade on my window, and so I, I woke up at exactly 8:40, and suddenly I see this poof and this orange light sort of explode on the side of the World Trade Center. And I can't really tell what it is. And so, and somebody calls me and says, you know, turn on your TV. And eventually I saw the other plane come around. And I'd been sort of deeply depressed for about a year before. Before 9-11? Before 9-11. I was in a marriage that was unhappy and I had writer's block. Yeah, when Jay started to talk about this depression, it was a very intense moment to say Jay's being so honest and so open. I'd reached a stage in my life where I was no longer a really young man and I couldn't keep writing about, you know, wild, crazy, drugged out party people. And eventually I, I did seek help and I got antidepressants and that helped. Writing about wines on a consistent base, it's some, something that also brings, uh, I'm sure, a ton of pleasure to you. A friend of mine who was the editor of House of Garden uh, approached me 
12, 13 years ago and said, how would you like to write about wine? And I said, oh, I, you know, I don't really, I'm not an expert. And it's turned out to be a wonderful um, addition to my life. It's, it's sort of like if somebody, if somebody paid me money to date a different supermodel every week, you know, I mean, that's sort of, um, <laughs> uh, some, something that one can't do um, <clears throat> on, on a practical basis. Uh, you create a new style also of describing wines. I mean, you're breaking all the rules. Well, partly because I didn't have that formal knowledge of, yeah. you know, I, I never took a wine course. What I'm good at is metaphors, and wines mm -hmm. remind me of other things, not necessarily yeah. fruits. They remind me of actresses, pop songs. When I say a Chablis is, is like Kate Ma Moss and a California Chardonnay is like Pamela Anderson, people understand I totally, that in, in... I totally see it. Yeah. You you know very well your wine, and uh, you, you try to... to uh, make believe you're not an expert, you're really an expert. I discovered a lot uh, about your life and, and I'm, you know, smarter after, uh, <laughs> after, after this episode. So we have a surprise for you. I don't think you have seen that. Whoa. Look at that, follow me. Hey. Jay, this is the surprise in your honor. Look at that. <laughs> Jay nice. did, did you do this? Right? No, I didn't do it. But you're going to sign it anywhere you want. Yeah. Oh. It's working, more or less. Thank okay. you. We did it. It's a work of art. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure. It was great. Jay today did the braised lamb shank, and I had that once in his house, and they were really delicious. And I'm glad that he brought that again today. It's pretty satisfying to have Eric repair, devour the dish that you prepared for him, although of course he does, did at least as much work as I did. When we sat down, I had no idea that I would finish my plate. And while we were talking, um, we were enjoying it very, very much. And suddenly the dish was gone. Hello, I'm Eric Repair, host of On The Table, only on the Reserve Channel. If you like my show, hit the subscribe button below. And hit the thumbs up if you like my show. Pharrell Williams here. Hi, I'm Joy Bryant. I'm Eric Repair. I'm Tom Colicchio. I'm Dr. Frank Lipman. The host of On The Table. The host of Across The Board. Host of Artist Talk. Host of Hooked Up. Host of the show, Be Well Week, Be Well Weekend, on the Reserve Channel. It's only on Reserve. Did you know that you can follow my show on social media sites like Facebook? Follow us on Twitter. If you're a fan of my show, hit the like button. All of the above. Share me with your friends. Treat yourself. You know, check out a new episode of my show, Hooked Up. And if you want to leave comments, feedback, ideas, whatever, love to hear from you. Leave a comment. And if you don't want to miss the show, be sure to subscribe. The one that's like down here, or is it here? Uh, somewhere down here. Thanks for watching the Reserve Channel. Only on YouTube. <laughs> Throw caution to the wind and ask yourself what rules.